So um, our next speaker is uh, Dr. Sue Boschma. Uh, Dr. Uh, Sue is a senior research scientist uh, with the New South Wales DPI based out of Tamworth. Over the last 15 years or so, Sue's focus for her work has been on tropical pastures, understanding how to sow, grow and utilise them in grazing systems in the northern inland of New South Wales. She's currently leading a project which is investigating the role of tropical grass pastures in southern New South Wales, and, and hence that's the, uh, the topic for today. Thanks, Sue. Thanks, Jeff. Uh, thank you very much uh, for the opportunity to, uh, to speak today, um, and a very special thank you to the Riverina LLS. Um, it's great to be able to come down and, and be able to speak to you about tropical pastures. I realise all the presentations you've had so far today have been very much about current issues, um, um, soil acidity, uh, legumes and the like. Um, so we're going to sort of, yeah, so me now talking about tropicals is going to be somewhat different. But um, so just to get a bit of an understanding about where you are with regard to tropicals, um, who has heard of tropicals? There's a fair bit of it in the media. Um, some people talk about them as being tropicals. They might be summer growing, subtropicals, C4s. Who's heard of tropicals? Not many, half, maybe half. All right, um, so who thinks tropicals may have potential down here in southern New South Wales? Few? Maybe 10? Okay. Who thinks we've lost the plot and what on earth am I doing down here? And I'll, 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 it's okay, you can put your hands up. Okay, so there's a few that think I've lost the plot. Fair enough. Um, who's undecided? There's a few of those as well. Fair enough. All right. Very good. Well, bear with me. Um, so of those, those that have heard of tropicals, has anyone trialled tropicals? Has anyone put some in? One, two, three, very good. Four, excellent. Now, of those who have tried them, were they successful? Who had success? What's success? Um, success is where they come up and they get to be grazed and they persist. None? <laughs> I've had discussions with Nathan before. I've spoken to him a couple of times, and I know that he's, he's all failed. Well, they came up, but they didn't persist. So who's, who has sown them, and, um, but you know, they weren't happy or they failed? All of the above. Okay. So um, of those of you who are here, um, is anyone planning on potentially sowing tropicals in the next, say, five years, depending on what sort of information they might get? Okay, so there's a few, so maybe, maybe 10 people. Excellent. All right, um, now for those of you that, have not, that are not familiar with tropical pastures, um, the pot plant that you all passed when you walked in, that's actually a tropical grass. So if you haven't seen it before, that's, that's what you're looking at. That one's actually um, digigrass, Colivar Premier. Um, it's come all the way from northern New South Wales. Um, so yeah, please have a look at it because it's, um, it's traveled a long way to get here. So look, there's been increasing interest in tropical pastures, and basically the, the um, I guess what got people, well, we've, the interest has been increasing for, for a few years, but it's really probably the last summer where things um, sort of picked up speed a fair bit, when we actually came out of the drought. So here, this is um, basically, this photo is taken in Tamworth. We'd had, oh, I don't know, about five, seven mils, something like that. There'd been a little bit of a green pick on it. And then we had, you know, over 100 mil. I think it was close to 150 odd mil and wooshka. We ended up with this incredible amount of feed and everyone was pretty excited. After it had been barren, brown, for so long during the drought, to actually have this sort of response was pretty remarkable. So certainly there's, the interest um, has, has hyped up since then. But in addition to that, we've actually had quite a few producers say that they're, they're actually getting more summer rainfall. So when you think about your experiences, who feels they're actually getting a bit more summer rainfall, more summer storms? So yeah, a few, few people, good, excellent. So, um, so some people are thinking they're getting more rainfall, but when you have a look at the long-term long -term figures, that this, the summer rainfall as a proportion of your total has actually been increasing for a while. 
So I guess we're getting to the point now that if you're getting a bit more summer rainfall, maybe the opportunity is there to utilise it when it falls. So use it or lose it within your system. And I guess that's, that's where, where tropicals could potentially fit. So uh, responding to that summer rainfall and then filling, depending on your enterprise, filling some of that, uh, that summer, autumn, early autumn feed gap. So we've done some modelling within, within a current project to actually look at where tropicals might potentially fit in, um, in southeastern Australia. Now this modelling is actually based solely on rainfall and temperature. It doesn't take into account soil at all. But you can see in, in the past, we've actually, you know, they've, you know, there, there is a role for them, or sorry, they could actually fit or that they, you will, they could grow. But when you actually look forward, you know, the, the actual area where they might fit is actually increasing, um, especially in those higher altitude cooler areas. So today, what I really want to, uh, to talk about, I suppose, is basically just give you a bit of an idea um, about tropicals, some of the advantages and disadvantages of them, uh, give you some data uh, from uh, some of the work we've been doing in northern New South Wales, and then uh, switch south and actually talk about some of the work we're doing down here. So you can actually see what they're doing down in this part of the world. So advantages. Tropical pastures are pretty widely adapted. Now we're talking about a group of species here and not all spe one species is not going to fit everywhere. So as a group, they're actually pretty widely adapted. So they range, um, we can grow them down to uh, five, four and a half for pH, right through to um, alkaline soils. There's some suited for, uh, for sandy, the lighter sandy soils through to your heavier soils. So there's, there's a range of species which are available and suited to different environments. Um, they are productive. They can produce an awful amount, an awful amount of feed um, on, with, with um, summer rainfall. They're highly responsive. They can have high water use efficiency. So again, there's an interaction there, there with, with water, but um, a new stand, you can produce um, over 20, a water use efficiency of over 20 kilos per hectare per millimetre of water used. But once they sort of settle down into, into a, bit of a bit of a routine, um, they, um, we're, we're finding we can get, say, 10, 10 to 16 kilos, um, um, yeah, kilos per hectare uh, per millimetre of water used. They are persistent. So we've actually had, uh, not, not all species, but we've actually had a number of species that have come through the, the drought we've just recently had um, well. And, and you saw the response that we had um, coming out of that. That was, that was digigrass, so we're pretty excited with its, its ability to be able to persist during the drought. They're also persistent under grazing. Uh, they are deep rooted, so they'll, they will root, um, they'll be able to extract water from, from below a metre. Um, they produce really good ground cover. Uh, they, um, we get over 70% uh, within the first 12 months of sowing them. And admittedly, there's an environmental interaction there as well. But um, they're able to, to cover the ground, which means you're, you're not losing as much water um, fr from your soil surface, and you're making, making the most of the rainfall. They're good for improving soils. So you've got, you've got your organic matter, improving your ground cover, improves your infiltration, increases carbon, multiple advantages. But one of the things I really do love about them is this ability to respond to summer rainfall. So this is a photo of, um, it is an experimental plot, but the plot on the left-hand side, uh, this was at the end of October. Normally the grasses would be growing in our part of the world um, by the end of October. Um, this experiment had, had, been ex um, had experienced um, over 14 months of below average rainfall. It had very little over the winter and had nothing to kick off in spring. It had a little bit of rain over Christmas time and there was some response, not much, so it wilted. And then again, we got some more rainfall in January, and three months, three weeks later, that was what we had. Now that's, you can almost lose a short scientist in that. <laughs> almost, but not quite. Okay, to be realistic, it's not all roses, I certainly recognise that. So let's just go through some of the disadvantages of these species. 
They only grow during the warmer months of the year. So incorporating them into your system, they're, you know, they're not going to provide year-round feed, a, a tropical on its own. So they're bounded, their growth is actually bounded by frosts, by cold temperatures. So you could expect, you know, expect growth from say November through to April, May. They are productive, but in order to maintain that productivity, they do need to be fertilised. Similar to your temperate pastures, temperate perennial pastures, they're not suited to short-term rotations. Okay, so you're looking at the same sort of expense to establish tropical as what you are for a temperate. So you don't really want to be having them on a short-term rotation, you want them there for the long term. Planning is essential, exactly the same as your, as your temperate pastures. You need to control your weeds, your summer grass weeds especially, prior to sowing these things to be able to, these sort of pastures, in order to get the best establishment. A couple of things they don't like is being waterlogged over the winter. So you wouldn't want to be putting these species somewhere where they're going to get inundated over winter. They don't like being cold and wet. And the other time that I have seen these species fall over um, is when you've had a wet winter, there's a huge bulk, a huge bulk of, of temperate annual legume and basically the grass gets smothered. So for us that was in uh, 2016 and um, so our tropicals didn't handle it very well and we actually had some plant losses but we also noticed that within our native species, our summer growing natives as well. So you know it wasn't just, it wasn't just on our, on our sowing species. Now, um, I've got a question, marks again, question mark against the uh, lower nutritive value because um, that's one of the comments that we often get from people is saying they're cardboard. And I guess if you let them get too big, they become rank once they senesce, yes, you're right, the quality does fall out of them. But I think you also need to compare them. So there's a grazing management issue, but you think you also need to compare them with what else is gonna be growing when they're growing. And it's not going to be phalaris, lucent, it, these guys are not lucent, but, but, they've, um, but they've got reasonable quality in their own right. Now I've mentioned that you need nitrogen in order to maintain that productivity. So here's some work that we did um, in Tamworth. Uh, this is a dry land, a dry land um, experiment. We applied five different rates of nitrogen, ranging from zero through to 300 kilos. We certainly weren't expecting anyone to be putting on 300 kilos of nitrogen. It was more just experimentally, just to see whether we could you know, make it sort of peak, um, peak out. So you can see here rose grass, it's a bit of a beast and it will just, yeah, if, it's, if it can access water and nitrogen, it will just grow, it just loves the stuff. But you'll see with our digit grass, it actually tipped over. And um, it was interesting having a look at the forage sorghum as well. It didn't get the, again, we're talking dry land, it didn't get that response to nitrogen um, in this particular experiment. But I guess what we're looking at, or in, in we're actually recommending, that you probably be wanting to look around 50 to 100 kilos of nitrogen in order to, um, to maintain productivity. When you look at uh, the productivity of these grasses, so if they've got nitrogen and um, good source, stored soil moisture, they can rock it. So you're looking at over 100 kilos, uh, kilos per hectare per day that they can grow. And we've actually experienced this um, at one of our experiments at Cowra. It, it did that last summer, easy peasy. Now, the, when you don't fertilise it, but it's got nitrogen, it just pokes along steadily. It will respond, but it's nowhere near at the rate, at the same rate. And when, you, when it runs out of water, it stops. It just stalls and then sits there waiting for the next rainfall event. When you have a look at the quality of these, of these species, um, here's some crude protein and ME. I think this was, this was actually um, on a two week regrowth. So in order to maintain high quality, you want to be actually be utilizing them regularly to keep them short and green. Um, and uh, so with no nitrogen, we had crude protein in this particular example. Um, close to 14 with an ME of 9.1. And when you, actually, when you add nitrogen, your crude protein goes up, ME not, not much, which you wouldn't expect. Okay, so this is all great. I'm from Northern New South Wales, coming down here telling you about tropicals and how they might work for you. So what are we actually doing in your part of the world? Part of a current project we've got is trying to address that. So this is some work 
um, we've got a range of sites looking at a number of different species. So in this, we've got a range of tropical species as well as some temperate species, just as a nice comparison because C4, the C3s are our benchmark. So what I want to, to uh, focus on is the three, um, Sakara, Gulgawi and Yanko, where we've got experiments and that they're the, the information I'm going to present this afternoon. Uh, just a bit of a plug. For those of you that might be interested in coming and having, um, having a look at any of our experiments or over, um, over a sort of west of here, please, um, we've actually got paddock walks tomorrow. Um, so if you'd like to come along and have a look, uh, please come and see us at the end of, um, end of this presentation, or sorry, at the end of the session. Now these experiments have been subjected to the, the cold, that it gets at orange through to the drought, it's, it's seen it all. So we've, um, these, most of these experiments were established in spring 2018. Some of them were irrigated to help get them up because at the end of the day we were looking at persistence. Um, but most of them, um, a number of them just sort of came up um, on the rainfall that they had. Um, now none of these have been grazed by livestock. They've all been mowing, mowing to date because we're interested in um, getting as much data off them as possible. So focusing on cara first. Now my figure here, you've got plant frequency across the bottom. Now plant frequency over time is actually a measure of the persistence. So the higher the number, the better. Up the left hand side, whoa, we've got dry matter production for this summer. So that was from spring through to February 21. Um, so like last month. Now here the tropicals in this experiment were sown in 2018. So this is their third summer. The temperates actually didn't come up in this experiment and they've just been re-sown um, autumn last year. So this is their first year and that was their first cut. But it's going to be really nice over time seeing that interaction with when things grow, when things shut down with the environment that they've got. So as you can see here, not surprisingly, the, uh, the temperate pastures, which are all shown in, in red, um, um, are all up in the top right hand corner, which you would expect. So anything that's in that top right hand means that it is um, above average persistence and production today. But Premier Digit is up there as well. So we've actually got a tropical up in that corner too. When you go and have a look at Yenko, so we're going down a lower rainfall. This is um, some production from these, from these species. Um, here we did have some temperates go in, but they didn't establish, and we haven't been able to get them established since. Uh, this experiment was actually, uh, the tropicals were established under irrigation. Uh, and they, I think they were irrigated for, I think it was something like the first five months, um, and then they've been on their own since then. But uh, you can see they're not, you know, the autumn production is variable depending on the, the species. Winter production is pretty poor, as you would expect. Um, but we've actually had, you know, some nice spring, uh, spring production, certainly not brilliant, like we're talking four ton up until that point. Um, herbage, we have done some production for the summer, but I didn't have those data ready to be able to give them to you today. So we've got uh, Kaikuyu and rose grass. So over that nine month period, uh, we've got a couple of rose grasses and Kaikuyu have done well. Um, and we've also got Premier Digit there bringing, you know, bringing that, it's had really nice spring production as well. So this experiment's going to be interesting to watch because it was, it had that irrigation to, a, to a help establishment, but now that it's on its own, to actually see which of those species survive longer term. This is Gulgawi, so we're dropped rainfall again a little bit more. Now that's the list of the species that were that were sown. Sorry, it's quite a busy, a busy figure. But down in the, the bottom, we've got the four temperate species that were sown at this site. Now the temperates were sown in autumn 2019. The tropicals were sown in November 2019. There was 20 millimetres of rainfall, I think, 20 mils of rainfall, I think, the, the, the week or well, day or week after the, the tropicals were sown. So a month later, uh, the team went out and, and um, had a look at the frequency of those. And you can see that there was, oh, oh I did that. 
So you've got this here, they're actually, the temperates look pretty good, which is great, while the tropicals are looking pretty ordinary. But uh, move on six months, and you've actually got here, gee, I've got an unsteady hand. They've already, six months later, the temperates had already started to fall out, while the tropicals were actually doing pretty good. And now, um, second summer on, so these frequencies were just taken last month, um, you can see that the blue numbers mean that frequency has increased. So it means that the, the plant size, the number of plants has actually increased through time, while the, uh, the red numbers um, means that they've actually, it's actually declined. So it's still early days and we're certainly not, we're certainly not recommending um, tropicals, but it's just really interesting to, to have a look at the difference between your, your temperate and your tropical species um, in this low rainfall environment. Now obviously, if you're going to incorporate tropical pastures into your system, then you, um, something else has got to go. And what are the consequences of that on your current system? So uh, this is actually for Wagga. So this is some modelling that was done, uh, looking at, so I'm just basically outline of the farm there, 1,600 hectares, eight paddocks in a crop pasture rotation, and four permanent pasture paddocks. Now it's the four permanent pasture paddocks that we'll just concentrate on. In this case, we're looking at an annual system of ryegrass subclover as, as, the, um, as the permanent, and we're just replacing it paddock by paddock of those four paddocks with a tropical grass subclover. Now, just to keep things simple, I've, I've simplified the figure. So the blue solid line is where you've got the annual system. So, you know, the standard system of, of ryegrass subclover. The red hash line is where you've got two of each, two tropical and two of your annual. And the, the green dot is where you've replaced all of those with a tropical. Now, not surprisingly, you've got this reduction here in spring but what's really nice is this response here. And that's going to be, be able to, to contribute to filling some of that, you know, that late summer, early autumn, autumn um, feed gap. But it is a compromise. Now, establishment is certainly something we recognise is going to be a significant issue. You know, if you've got, while you might be getting more summer rainfall, it's, you know, it's a bit hit and miss, comes in, in you know, in storms. So trying to get an understanding of how we can minimise the risk of establishment failure is going to be important. So this was just some basic modelling to have a look at the opportunity to do that. So uh, starting with Cowra. So what we have here on our figure, the tropical pasture was sown mid-September. And then we, using a, a couple of different rules, we had to look at the opportunity to be out for emergence of the tropical pasture over the following six months, so six months through to March. What we have here on the right-hand side is the frequency. So the number of times uh, over a 30-year period, which finished last summer, um, that of when rainfall would, um, sorry, when emergence is likely to happen. Now of that 30-year period, here we've got establishment success or emergence, 71% uh, of, of the years, which is okay. When you actually go further south, it's not quite as good. Not good, really, at all. I think there's room for improvement. Absolutely. But you know, this, this is what it was about. We, we knew that there was going to be issues, but now um, we, can, we can start to develop strategies and trial some different strategies to see whether we can improve that. One strategy we did have a look at is that um, Wagga and Leeton, um, these were using a red chromosome. By changing the water holding capacity from a red to a brown ver vertisol, chromosome, we're actually able, at Leeton, able to increase success to 97%. So it means that there is opportunity with where we put them in the landscape, the, soil, the type of soil that we choose. And then we've also got opportunities of ground cover. Now, if we, if we sow into a stubble where we've actually got better ground cover, we can actually maintain that soil surface moist for longer, we actually improve the likelihood of, um, of success. I'm pretty excited about the opportunity of tropical pastures as an opportunity, as, as, as another tool in your, in your pasture toolbox. Certainly we're not talking about replacing C3s, your temperate pastures. This is certainly not a Phalaris takeover, 
but this is basically what we're suggesting is that this could be an opportunity to, uh, to use some of that summer rainfall and tropicals could be a means of doing so. But we certainly recognise that there's a lot of questions. Um, establishment being one, being a big one. Persistence, which species should you be using? Where in the landscape should they be put? Is there, is there an interaction with that? And certainly soil type. Compatible legumes. We know tropicals have a short growth window. So by adding a temperate annual legume or, or, a, or a perennial legume being loosened, I, I don't know, we, we've got a lot of work to be done on that. But that is by incorporating legumes into the system, then it means that you potentially got a much wider window that when that pasture can be grazed. Now, we've, um, we also need to get an understanding about what you need. What information do you need, do you want, in order to have the confidence to give these guys a bit of a go? Now, this, um, I've had the opportunity to speak to you this afternoon, and I really appreciate that opportunity, but I'm certainly um, only a very small part in a, in a large team. So I'd just like to acknowledge the, uh, the scientists that are, that are working on this, and um, we've also been very fortunate to have some excellent technical support. Now, just one last thing. Please whip your, could you please take your phones out, take a photo of this, because um, I'm hoping to hear from you all. Come on, get your phone out, please take a photo. Okay, so what, I, what we are interested in doing is we've, as part of our current project, we've had, um, we've had a number of workshops in central and northern New South Wales, where we're talking to producers about what they think are the opportunities for tropical pastures. So this is what we think. What do you feel are the advantages and disadvantages to your system? and what information do you need? And I'd really like to have um, a workshop or two down here. So um, I'd really, if you are interested in tropicals, you don't have to have trialled them, but if you think that, if you are interested in finding out more about tropicals or think they may have an opportunity in your system, please uh, text or ring Sarah Baker. Sarah's actually here, she's over here on the side. Um, or come and speak to us afterwards. Uh, we'd, we'd love to get your contact details and um, you can come along and have a, have a chat to us about tropicals and maybe attend a workshop if you would like. We also are interested in, um, we've also got a survey floating around the state. It's been sent to a number of different mailboxes. If you've happened to have received one, um, really love you to, um, to fill it in and send it back to us, please. Um, we do actually have some copies of the survey here if, you've, if you're inclined to do a survey. Um, if you prefer to do something online, it's also available online. If you just uh, Google New South Wales DPI Pastures, scroll down our Pastures webpage and you'll see a link at the bottom. But um, a very, another, again, a, a plug for our um, paddock walk tomorrow. If you're interested in coming over to Yanko or Gilgawi, um, we've got, um, we are having paddock walks tomorrow, so um, we'd love to see you there. Again, poor Sarah, please contact Sarah. On, uh, on her number there, or come and see us at the end. I think there's actually some flyers for the day sitting up on the LLS um, desk at the back. I think that's me. Thank you. Very good, thank you, Sue. Um, some exciting stuff. Um, be good to see some great results out there over the next couple of years.